someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbitrator between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against the kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to share my crops or store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and I build bigger ones and there I will store all my grain and my goods and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it is. Correction. This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich to work God. Amen. I invite you to join in a moment of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Lord, may all of our thoughts and our feelings, the meditations of our minds and of our hearts, 
and the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Author Mary J. Beckman uh, tells about dipping out a, a bowl of ice cream for her granddaughter, and Beckman asks her, how much would you like? And the little girl thought for a second and then said, oh, give me too much. <laughs> you know, I can relate to that granddaughter, right? Can there ever be too much of a good thing? Well, apparently there can be. Too much of a good thing can be a bad thing, especially if the good things we pursue distract us from the life that God intends for us. You know, there, there's something unique in this story uh, in Luke that you, that you can't find in other parables in the New Testament. This is the only time in the Gospels when God directly calls someone a fool. But when, you know, in Jesus' story, there, there are a lot of people who do foolish things. We can think of parables uh, with some foolish folks. Uh, don't we do some foolish things? But, but this is the only one of Jesus' stories in which God speaks up and calls someone a fool right to his face. And that's that. That's pretty serious stuff. The Greek word used here for fool literally means without inner perspective. The Bible contains, you know, whole lists. I mean, it isn't Proverbs so rich in a, a list of, of foolish and wise so we can learn how to live, live a life that is God. Fools live only for themselves, only for the moment. How would you like to reach the end of your life and God call you a fool? Man, I, 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 don't, want, I don't want that. So let, let's take a serious look at the difference between a fool's perspective and God's perspective. And you know, the obvious place to start is with money. The aggrieved brother in the text is concerned. He wants his share of the inheritance. And he's not the only one that we meet in the gospel who is so preoccupied with their stock portfolio. Remember the so-called rich, young ruler? He could do just about everything in life except part with his financial assets. For him, money is what God used to be, as George Orwell once put it. When religious leaders have money in their pockets, even the, the highest priest. And, and when Jesus asked whether was asked whether it is okay to send Caesar your, your quarterly estimated tax payments, Jesus asked them for a coin. And incredibly, one of, one of the robes, religious types, pulls a coin out of his pocket and, and gave him one. And Jesus noted the head of Caesar on the coin and famously said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. You know, Jesus isn't anti-rich. He was anti-greed. Take care. 
be a god who has all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist of an abundance of possessions. <coughs> that first warning, take care, it's, it's a Greek word to, to see as in to understand and comprehend. Jesus is saying, don't you get it? Open your eyes, you dimwits, and guard against greed in all of its forms. Security. Security is important in the ancient world when thievery was common. So much easier than today without all our high-tech <coughs> security protection options. Peer into the darkness. Make sure no one is lurking in the alley with a baseball bat. Keep your wits about you. Don't let greed grab you by the throat and rob you of your life. This is Jesus' meaning. You know, greed, greed. Greed is a detour that can quickly become a one-way street to a dead-end road. There's no cul-de-sac. You can't turn around. Once greedy, always greedy. And this is a deep, dark secret of avarice. Once it's grabbed you. Yeah, yeah. There, there's not too many Scrooges that, 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 that let go of their, their greed and avarice and, and turn their life around miraculously at the end of the story. Right? Once it's grabbed you, it's got you, you're hooked. You'll always be unhappy. There will never ever be enough. No wonder Jesus says, for one's life does not consist of the abundance of possessions. The alternative to greed is generosity. Like, like that widow who whom Jesus and the disciples watched make her donation at, at the temple. She taught the disciples that generosity was not was more than an amount. It's an attitude. It's measured not by how much we give, by how much it costs us. Truly, I tell you, Jesus said, this poor old widow has put more than all of them, for all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in all she had to live on. Probably one of our, our, our most noted preachers in, in the last century, the, the, the late Dr. Hayden Robinson defines covetousness <coughs> as simply craving more of what you have enough already. You always want too much ice cream, too much, too much. To vaccinate against the, the, the virus of avarice, why, why not? Why not start being more generous? You have enough already. Begin by, by sorting out your possessions. You probably won't miss them. We, we, we all probably, I, I, I know, we've got, we got more stuff than, 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 than we can use. Yeah. You know, you're a fool if you don't give some of it away. Like Jesus says, you fool. So it is with those who store up their treasures for themselves but are not rich toward God. <coughs> Jesus is an anti-rich. You know, Jesus is clearly anti-worry. He wanted us to simplify our lives. Aren't, aren't we so good at, at, at making our lives complicated? And, and this happens according to that great theologian, George Carlin, because we have accumulated an abundance of possessions, or what Carlin calls stuff. 
in, in his famous riff on stuff, he, he says in part, that's all your house is, a place to keep your stuff. You didn't have so much stuff, you wouldn't need a house. You could just walk around all the time. A house is just a pile of stuff with a cover on it. That's what your house is, a place to keep your stuff. Why do you go out and get more stuff? <coughs> Some things, sometimes you, you gotta move. You gotta get a bigger house. Why? No room for your stuff anymore. Having all this stuff induces worry. And worry becomes a burden you carry around, a burden that gets heavier with time because you keep buying more stuff. Read possession. And, and, and soon we're ill with worry that kind of like a, a, a tumor in the brain. It does nothing but give you a, a, a raging headache and drive you crazy. The man's riddled with anxiety. He thought to himself, what should I do? I have no place to store my crops. Woe is me. What should I do? I don't have room to store all my crops. In other words, I don't have enough room for my stuff. Man gets this insane idea. I'll just, I'll just tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my stuff. Well, the actual words are my grain and my goods. Stuff. What a fool. The man's possessions, passions were, were his possessions. But it was also, also this great source of anxiety. I'll confess, Tammy's a whole lot better about giving away and and not piling up stuff than I am. You know, my stuff doesn't rule my life, but, well, there are some times it gets out of control. <laughs> and the remedy for worry is simplification. When we learn to be happy with the simple pleasures of life, a lot of anxiety just melts away like ice in your mouth on a hot July day. It gives you pleasure in the process. Someone said, success is getting what you want. Happiness is wanting <clears throat> what you get. See the difference there? Like, Jesus said, therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you eat, about your body, what you wear, or the more, for life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. Yeah. I think it really was true that I was probably happier with everything I owned I could fit in the back of my Honda Civic. <laughs> Trisha Mayer is the Senior Director of Research digital engagement at Microsoft Corporation. Now there's some people dealing with some serious stuff. She's also a follower of Jesus. In her senior position at one of the world's most successful companies, Meyer says she has seen how the shackles of wealth could just choke the life out of people. In contrast, Meyer and her family have found that generous giving leads to joy and freedom. Author Randy Alcorn interviewed Trisha Meyer, and two quotes from the interview really stood out for me. She said, being loved by God and knowing him is to have riches beyond measure. Having all the money you need on earth is merely having another full-time job. There's no comparison. And the second quote is, every time we give, we acknowledge that everything we have is given to us by God. He is our lifeline, our source for everything. 
He is our lifeline, our source for everything. Trisha Myers followed Jesus' teaching and example in the way she used her wealth because she knows it's actually God's wealth that she's giving back for God's work. So, Jesus is not anti-rich, but he is aware. Aware, as we can be too, that, that wealth is not without problems. And yet, yet because with God all things are possible, even the rich can gain eternal life. Jesus knew, he knew what wasn't all about money, but the love of money. Not about possessions, but the abundance of possessions. Not about working hard, but only working for themselves. Not about being rich, but not being rich towards God. So whether you're into stocks or bonds, gold coins, cryptocurrencies, paper money, Picasso's or red wands, real estate, Teslas or Fords, Jesus probably doesn't care. In, in fact, one who noted Jesus himself would probably drive around in a Mini Cooper. Uh, Jesus, however, is against greed, against worry, against short-sightedness. And yet, Oh, Jesus is so, so in favor, so pushing us to be rich towards God. By using, by using our wealth, ethically, compassionately, responsibly, remembering that the things you've prepared, whose will they be?